The sailing mad town of Lorient was the final stopover of the 2011 to 2012 Volvo Ocean Race. And Group Armour had sailed into their home port at the head of the fleet, opening up a significant gap over the rest of the teams. Well, there we were, in a very enviable position. To be in front in the race by 25 points, when we started from Lorient, our base was last stage. We didn't have to talk much. We all dreamed about winning it, and we were really close to the goal. But, unfortunately, we could also have lost it at any point. As the boats prepared to start the final leg of this edition of the race, the situation was clear. For Group Armour, fourth place or better would guarantee overall race victory, whilst Puma, Camper and Telefonica faced an almighty tussle for the remaining podium positions. Group Armour were ahead with a clear chance to get overall victory, unless a last-minute disaster happened, which obviously we were expecting them to work hard to avoid with Puma, Camper and ourselves fighting for overall second place. So the boat that could beat its other rivals would finish second. It felt like having to go around the entire world in just one leg. Just six points separated the three chasing boats after more than 39,000 miles racing around the globe as the fleet made ready to depart the shores of Brittany on its way to its final destination. The last leg of just 500 nautical miles would see the fleet leave Lorient and cross the English Channel, round Fastnet Rock, and sail up the western coast of Ireland into Galway. Leaving Lorient was, you know, one of the more impressive send-offs of the race. We had good breeze, it was a beautiful day, and, you know, like Auckland, the fans get it. They, they, they love sailing, they love offshore racing in particular. If you love boats, uh, Lorient's a, uh, just an amazing place to, to go and hang out. Everybody was just looking forward to getting to Galway and getting forward to, you know, getting to the end of the race, but uh, you know, sometimes the shorter legs can be quite a lot harder than the longer ones in some respects, but the forecast was good, it was going to be a quick trip, and I think everybody was just counting the hours and looking forward to getting here. As the fleet jockeyed for position at the start line on departure day, disaster struck for one of the principal contenders. Camper with Emirates Team New Zealand was penalised in the pre-start and forced to execute a penalty turn, leaving them some distance behind their closest rivals as the fleet headed towards the Celtic Sea. I remember just instantly looking at the, as we got off the line after we did our penalties, just like, you know, like, with the way the forecast was for us for the leg, we needed to be on the front foot from the get-go, similar to when we left um, Lorient, we had a great start on the import side of things and we had miles on the competitors that it took them most of the day to catch up on. So I had a huge concern that we we're just going to see other teams stretch away from a mistake that I, that I did. A resurgent Team Telefonica led the way, tracked by Puma Ocean Racing, whilst Group Armour was seemingly content to sit back, for the moment at least. The first move for the fleet was east, away from their final destination, towards the coastal islands of Ile de Gois and Belle Ile. Yeah, the departure went well. We started well. The leg is short, so it's important to get the departure right sail a good course and get some advantage. So let's see if we can make the most of it. There's only a day and a half left, so we have to push to beat them. We need to aim for second place at least in the general ranking and win this leg. Puma had also made a good start, right behind Telefonica. Not so for Camper, but some slick crew work saw the Spanish Kiwi boat begin to make amends for their poor beginning, clawing their way up through the fleet to eventually catch and then pass the Black Cat. Seem to have a bit of pace in these conditions, which is nice. Um, we're just about 15 minutes from the bottom of Belle Isle, and uh, there's all our local 
local knowledge tells us there's often just a little light patch here. So we need to be particularly careful at this corner. A uh, big shift in the wind expected, change to a J1. Then we're upwind till we get right around this island you can see on our side here. Now it's just up. Last leg, that's all you have to say right there. It's the last leg. Uh, as usual though, we got uh, the whole group right here and you make a tiny mistake and you get passed and somebody else makes a tiny mistake and they get passed. So nothing's changed right now. And uh, uh, we're in for kind of a breezy night, but uh, uh, a lot of tight reaching should be fast towards Fastnet fast Rock. And we got Camper and Telly right here and Group Ama right on the transom. And um, as usual, all the boys are here to play together. Yeah, it was a great start. Nice weather, sun, wind, and lots of people to watch us leave. So it was fantastic. It was a good triangular course with a lot of manoeuvres. We didn't start too well, but then we tried to keep close to the others. We're going to continue on the coast that we know. But look, we won't have to do too much, I think. What's important is our speed and our management of the boat. Third place, David Triangle, and we've lost a couple of cents, which is not very good. So, uh, Camper managed to just catch us before the last mark, and uh, now we've started reaching for Bama, didn't take long to roll over. So, pretty tough course for us for the next, uh, well, the next 24 hours, all reaching. <laughs> Beginning of the end. That was a uh, fantastic start all through there. It was, uh, it was a full-on course to get around. We've all got through pretty clean. We're inside of all the boats. Uh, the boats you expect to be stretching their legs are starting to go. I mean, Group Home has gone from back here to... Uh, they are now just sniffing on camper. So they've gone from last in 40 minutes to... Uh, they are now in third position in a laughing match with camper. So pretty impressive stuff. But um, yeah, no, lovely sailing conditions and uh, we're hoping for uh, a good run to Ireland. The first rounding mark of the final leg was Belle-Isle, which literally means beautiful island. Not that our intrepid crews had too much of a chance to appreciate its beauty. Having turned, the fleet was finally pointing its nose towards Galway. When we got to Belle-Isle, we were third. It was a position that would normally not be satisfactory to us, but it was ideal for that stage. We never felt that we were in danger. Maybe we weren't as aggressive as in other legs, but we didn't feel the need to push as much this time. Yeah, we've had a mixed day. Uh, we had a good start and the second place for the triangle. Um, we had a problem with our furlan on our master zero, which uh, has dropped us back into a fourth position. We actually had a crummy leg down there. We, we were a little slow for some reason. And uh, we, had a, we had a furling problem with our code zero and, and Telefonica took off and got a little lead. Then Camper rolled us and Grubama rolled us and we came into their fourth saw that other boats in front of us were having a bit of a problem and actually cut the corner and immediately got back to second, you know, second or third. Ahead of Puma, Camper and Telefonica were absorbed in their own private battle. With so much at stake, it was clear the leg was going to be all about claiming the smallest of margins. Just come around the bottom of the island, tagged over. Telefonica just off our uh, windward hip. So, um, all in all, I'd, I'd almost say we're uh, in the lead. Just rounded uh, Belle Isle. Got uh, Abu Dhabi just up to windward here, a few hundred metres away. And uh, we're just seeing the, the fast boats um, typically be faster. So, um, no, we're just doing the best we can and hang in as long as we can and uh, get, get close so there's opportunities at the end running up into Galway we can uh, 
you know, being the hunt to take an opportunity if it, arise, if it arises. I think the short legs for Sanya are actually harder because the boats are always in sight, they're in contact. I mean, we need leverage, we need separation, we need to be in different weather and um, that's not going to happen over, over 500 miles. The short nature of the course meant a rethink as far as weight was concerned. A relatively small saving in carried load could make a vital difference. We'd gone as light as possible and, you know, by that, by that it was, you know, like light on food, light on fuel, uh, very light on our spares. And it was such a short leg, basically, if you have a breakage anyway, even, even it being a small one, you're probably going to be out of the leg. Um, <clears throat> in our sail program, we uh, decided to take an A4, a bit more of a running, running spinnaker. And, and that was that was really the, the only changes. Well, we prepared for the leg as best we could. The boat was ready and we had the right amount of weight. It was a leg in which the boats were going to sail very differently because there wasn't that much weight on board anymore. The boats were going to be quite light. And we've seen that when they do sail lightweight, there's quite a lot of difference between the way and also how fast each boat sails. The boats were indeed flying, but still evenly matched. It was nip and tuck as the leading four threaded their way through the islands off the northern coast of France. The yo-yo effect happened in between all the islands. We actually cut through one, two, three, might have been four different sets of islands. And you, you sail away, you come into the lee, everybody sails up, you're the first boat to poke out again. So that natural yo-yo kind of happened three or four times. Yeah, we're going very well there. Uh, we're fighting against Prima for quite a long time. Come on, come on. Oh, we had them to lose it for a few hours here. Now uh, we has uh, put up the SDS, the storm jib, and uh, we're gaining slowly or gaining a little bit extra here now. But looks very good, it looks very promising. To start the ninth leg, thinking that we didn't really have any chance to win the race wasn't a great feeling. But we were still determined to give 100% to have a good leg and to be able to finish the race well. So it's true that we weren't very happy, which is understandable, because we'd worked hard and sacrificed a lot in order to try and win it. But at the end of that leg, where our rudder got broken, it prevented us from winning it. But the feeling from everybody was that we had to keep fighting. We had to sail a good leg, and there was never a moment when anybody gave up. In fifth position, Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing was battling with structural damage. Lorient had been designated a non-haul-out stopover, and race organizers had decreed that teams would incur a points penalty if they decided to lift their boats out of the water to carry out repairs. The Emirati boat had decided to soldier on. We could see we had damage to our boat. We could tell from the numbers very, very early on in the leg. Consistently, really, from when we left the shores of Belle Isle, we just were never achieving more than 92% of our, of our target speed. So it became apparent quite quickly, and then we could feel the vibration underneath. So you know, we suspected pretty hard what we were dealing with, and, um, but we just decided, you know, we just had to battle on and try and keep Sandy behind us as best we could. The whole leg was, was pr pretty frustrating because we knew we couldn't race, you know, how we wanted to or how we, how we could. And, um, you know, I don't agree with the race organisers uh, and the jury's decision to basically penalise boats for lifting their boat. We damaged the boat on the leg from Lisbon to Lorient, you know, through no fault of our own, and we weren't able to lift the boat and, and affect that repair as well as we could have done, and then we suffered for it in the next leg. As the fleet sailed towards the northwest tip of France, the first split developed with Puma and Sanya opting to sail to the west of Ile de Seine. I have a phrase which, which drives Tom at us crazy, but I always say, when in, if there was no other boats out here, which way would you go? And, and that's my way of, of 
he and I talking things through. And I would say it's not that we're nonconformists, but I would rather just do the right thing. That split around, it was a big reef, and it was a, a little small island, big reef. Um, that, to me, made all the sense in the world. Um, the way we do it, the Navigator presents educated options, which he does very, very well. And then ultimately, ultimately the responsibility is on me to say right, left, high, low, in or out, you know, whatever it may be. I hate to admit, but I had no doubt that what we were doing was correct. You can see that patch of clear water there, that's a 5.4 in low water. Just here. Yeah. Just watch the one here. But a pretty famous uh, spot here at the top of Biscay, Cape Grass. We're just starting to get into a bit of seaway. Uh, there's Kelly behind us. We're, we're, we just went through to a world of them. Um, the group armor just behind them. Puma's gone the high side of, of the rocks here. we got coming up within the next hour it's 15 knots now it'll build to 25 and we've got to go to a J2 so then we're jib reaching so yeah, I'm, not sure. I'm not sure we're better than we have been at it um, I just you know we just need to either if we could stay in the lead going across the channel here to island or if not at least stay in touch with these guys we always wanted to stay on the western side of the fleet um, so that when it got really windy we could, we could put our bow down and, and cash in on that leverage, if you like. Um, I think, you know, certainly in our, with our race against Abu Dhabi it worked. Um, they didn't gain that much when they originally went low and they, they paid quite a lot when they had to put their bow up to come back up to the exclusion zone. Puma did well, and, and so did Sanya by going to the west of uh, you know, the Raz de Sen. And um, yeah, we, we, we looked at it pretty hard. There should have been better current inshore, but the way the wind lifted, you know, they managed to get west quite cheaply, uh, and that set them up well for the for the sort of following reaching mark. That was out of whole plan, and we assumed that it was everyone else's plan as well. So we were a bit surprised when they started going to leeward. But um, no, we just stuck stuck with it. It all made sense at the time, and. Um, yeah, in hindsight, we're glad we didn't didn't change them from the plan. As dusk settled over the fleet, the first effects of the expected low began to kick in. Well, obviously we know those passages, and we were confident in what we chose, and the path we took, and how things can change on the sea. We had confidence in the speed of the boat. They were all very close in terms of speed, so we knew that there wasn't going to be much difference between them. We just to make sure that our timings was good. And that worked, apart from the Ile de Seine, where boats started to put distance between one and another. It was clear to everyone that there was a certain choice to be made there in terms of the route. We were confident with the route we chose, which we analysed before we left. We knew the front was coming over and we literally went from the uh, fractional to the J2 and, and we were hoisting it as we saw the breeze coming down on the water and had it up and furled and did it spot on and and Telly delayed and we you know they got past us as we were bearing away dropping the fractional um, and then we were straight back past them because they stayed on the fractional and had a very difficult very difficult time of it I think doing the change so we'd probably put two three miles on them then and then. We're into the breeze the models have been doing a really good job at handling it and the weather team did a good job of preparing us for it so um, we had a couple of nice changes just on time. Uh, we're currently first we've got probably group armour is second now. 
just about a mile behind us and directly behind us, Californicus. It's a little more, ex little more extreme. Um, always suits us. Initially, those extreme conditions worked in Camper's favour as they held the lead. But as the night progressed, Telefonica and Puma, as is their wont, drew level once again. Well, during the night, we had a difficult situation because we had to change sails, and it was a complicated scenario. These sail changes are difficult, with lots of water coming over the boat with the speed of the boat. You want to slow down a bit, but that's also difficult. So the sail changes and the speed of the boats influence the positions overnight. Pretty good night and um, dug ourselves out of our little position in the pack as we uh, as we seem to do all the time, as we have to do. But um, no, we're in a little bit better spot at the moment, so hopefully we can keep it going. Monica are able to sort of sail us down a bit last night. They just popped through to lure of us. Um, you know, we had sail changes and it was pretty good. Every sail change we did, we put a mile on. Um, all the other guys were actually doing, doing them nicely in the right sequence with the right amount of breeze. You know, we got 80 miles to the rock as well, so we should be, should be hopefully well and truly in touch with them still by then. Fast at rock is, I mean, it's an overused word, but it's epic. I have a lot of history around that rock. I think I got in a protest at that rock. I left a guy who tried to cut the corner on us and we went head to wind and I told him we're gonna run aground and he screamed uncle finally and we bore off and they did a 720. So maybe I'm one of the only people in history that tried to smash a fellow competitor into the rock. Once we get to the rock, there's a little brick that you can hit just off it and there's a, so you need to go around as close as you can without hitting the bricks. Every now and again, someone hits it. We just need to make sure we're in front and stay in front. The Fastnet Rock? It's true that it's an iconic rock. To see it with the light on top. Fastnet means a lot to me. I vividly remember my first Fastnet race and approaching the rock, and it just looks cool. You know, it looks imposing. It's got the awesome lighthouse just sort of stuck on the edge there, and um, there's always a sense of achievement when you round the rock. Sanya, Abu Dhabi, and Group Ama all sailed the Fastnet race, all rounded right behind a boat called Rambler 100. First boat around Fastnet Rock, turning the corner to come back, and literally their keel snapped off. Thank goodness all those people are still around to talk about it, but um, sobering. Sobering for every, every member of this race, I guarantee you that. The first boat bathed in the reassuring glow of the Fastnet light was Puma Ocean Racing. We are at Fastnet Rock and we're doing just fine. We snuck ahead of the group overnight, but 
sneaking ahead doesn't mean a whole lot because I could almost hit him with my three iron right behind us. So uh, we got, as always, we got a little dog fight on our hands, uh, but we're rounding the infamous Fastnet Rock, which is always very, very cool. Team Telefonica was second to round the rock, whilst behind them Group Armour and Camper could have practically shaken hands as they reached the iconic landmark. Pumo sliding, sliding down over the top of us, just coming into the rock. Um, was a was a concern, you know. It's got the boat that was in second place, you know, now in the lead, and we were sort of third, fourth, albeit extremely very close to second. The boat that goes around Fastnet Rock first, I'm not sure there's a trophy for that. <laughs> so it sounds all well and good, but uh, not meant to be. Yep, I live about five and a half miles directly in there. From the brick, oh, five metres. However close he went, we had to go closer. And that set us up to stay above Group Parma all the way up to the point, and, and that kept us above Telefonica, and that set us up. We're fifth place, going around. Not ideal, but um, we're not too far from the others. I think about 12 miles behind. So um, we still may have a few opportunities to come over the next 20 hours before we get a goal in. It's a bloody difficult way to get to Ireland to sail around the world first. It's pretty nice to finally be here. the fleet travelled up the ruggedly beautiful western coast of Ireland. This is, I think, the third time I've come down this coast, and it just ceases to amaze me. Every time you come down it, Ireland, how green it is, how beautiful it is, the jagged cliffs that have probably seen more awful storms than God himself, you know? It's just an amazing place, beautiful place. More than halfway through the leg, and there was still nothing to choose between the leading pack of four. One of the boats needed to make a decisive move. Hang on to three, four, three. So this is a, a massive battle um, for the second place here. Um, you know, virtually, the finishing order will um, will dictate the, uh, the the leaderboard in terms of. Um, second, third, and fourth. Uh, unfortunately, Group Armour's probably got a few too many points on. They've, uh, they've got to basically come last for, for anything to happen. So uh, it's, it's a yacht race, and uh, anything can happen, and it has happened in the past. We looked back at them for a few hours. But then they came past us, and then we followed them. We were fourth. We knew that fifth were 11 miles, 15 miles, and then 21 miles, so that we were reassured by that. We knew that we could be fourth, even though it's not that good. But it was a race about speed. We weren't going to get close to Camper, for sure. But we weren't far from the two others in front of us. And we had the same distance between them. We couldn't do much, we just had to keep going and then see if an opportunity was going to present itself before Galway. The decisive move came from Camper as they chose to hoist their A4, a running spinnaker, and began to sail through the competition.
Once we got around the rock, the wind became lighter. We had to make a maneuver, and obviously the boats closer to the coast had less wind. That affected us and Puma. Camper managed to overtake Grupama, coming up very, very fast from behind. And well, we managed to go through that zone, but suffering quite a lot. Once we left that zone and we got into a quicker area, Camper managed to overtake us too. Camper had the cat firmly in their sights. At the back of the fleet, it was all on between Sanya and Abu Dhabi as well. Unable to reach top speed, the Emirati boat was struggling to sail away from Mike Sanderson's team. Half a mile behind uh, Abu Dhabi, just better nice little gain as they had to attack the run one of the corners where we, where we managed to pinch it up and lay. So uh, expect we'll end up on spinnakers. A bit of a run down there, so if we can. Uh, stay in touch like this and maybe we can do something with the timing of the drives or when we host the right saves. At the front of the fleet, Puma Ocean Racing was still holding a slender lead, but Camper was gaining hard and there was little the American boat could do about it. Yes, uh, they're still in the old stuff. They're not out into where we are yet. It's been a bit of a precession, but um, just trying to track down Puma, get in front of them, win this leg. So uh, plenty of excitement going on, plenty to play out over the night too. There was actually quite a bit of compression going on there. And, and we were still doing very, very nicely. We were holding the guys off behind and we were gaining on Puma. Group Armour Telly took a little bit out of us and we took, took distance out of Puma. Just the usual sort of compression you have approaching a land. And it's just, you know, we, we, we were using different sails quite often to, to a few of the other teams. You know, like even even when it was right on the crossover between the Marshead Zero and the A4, it's like let's put the A4 up because this will spook the herd. Yeah, Ashling, this is Senya. Over. Nice to see you. Um, I hope you had a nice trip. Over. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, keeping an eye on us. It's uh, very reassuring knowing you guys were that close. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in Galway. Over. The pivotal manoeuvre of the leg was the jibe east towards Galway. Got to, hopefully we're one driving in to the Aran Islands. Over, We've got Rupama uh, and Telefonica going high and fast above us and camp are soaking below us. So we're somewhere in the middle at the moment. Let's see what happens. Group Ama had a wonderful opportunity because nobody gave a crap about them at that point because the race is won. So they get to sail free willy-nilly you know, everything's gravy at that point. So they could jive first, they could jive last, they could jive, you know, they could hang out and eat croissants and drink coffee for a while and come in fourth. They, they didn't care if I were them. They should have been, we, we were wondering if they were celebrating by then. You know, do they have a case of wine already broken out at this stage? With one hour before the jive, before we changed direction, we waited for that moment. 
We were still on the outside and staying there. Nothing happened, so we had to open up the game and go inside the fleet a little bit. Et euh, voilà, donc, euh, donc on a déclenché l'empannage, on a été effectivement un petit peu surpris quand on soit les premiers. So we mais and we were surprised that we were first, but it allowed us to use our position euh, voilà, de, to be more aggressive. Euh, une position qui était cette fois-ci cette fois beaucoup plus agressive. Hey, we drive, uh, Brad. Brad From a tactical point of view, we're really struggling to understand fully what was going on. What we were quite confident in was that we were going to protect the inside. We were going to be the boat to jive first, or we were just going to go the same same time as, as those guys. In fact, we were we talked about it for 20 minutes before Group Armour had jived. Group Armour jived, we went, you know, probably within a minute or two of them. That was the call of the race for us, right? there. Once Camper had jibed, they remained the most easterly boat in the fleet, a position of strength for the Spanish-Kiwi combination. So they jibed first, that didn't shock us. We actually jibed underneath them in a nice position. Um, Camper, I give credit to Camper because they took a big risk on this leg and they brought a big spinnakery sail for downwind sailing. And it became immediately obvious that they could so they could just go lower and they started closing down on top of us. So instead of letting them kind of come down and crush onto us, we decided we're not going to win that battle against them. Let's go win the battle that we can win. And that is go out and jive in front of Telefonica and hope that hope that side wins. We're risking a lot here, so let's see what happens. Let's see if we can take advantage here. If we can jibe well and gain some advantage, it's probable that conditions will be easy at the entrance of the bay and also later on. All of this area is a bit of madness. Let's see. It's 0.8 miles. Let's see if we can overtake them. At the rear of the fleet, Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing and Sanya were still in close contact as they prepared to jibe towards the finish. It's all on now. We are on the final jibe at the doorway at the moment. Oh, it should be the final jibe. You see these just guys just down to lured. We're slightly to weather them, so it means we can get down on them without losing too much. And they're going forward a little bit, so uh, I'm kind of hoping this little move of us jiving early is going to close the gap a bit. And uh, we'll make for a really tight sprint in the goalway. We'll see if we can beat these uh, lads in. I hope we can. Should be all on. Busy night coming up. Meanwhile, the four boats at the head of the fleet had negotiated the final obstacle on the run into Galway. As they passed the Aran Islands, Camper had extended over second-placed Group Armour, and as the leaders caught sight of the first of an armada of spectator boats, they knew the journey was almost over. I am stunned at how many people know my name. <laughs> <laughs> well outside, you know, probably 35, 40 miles away was the first spectators coming up. Kenny, we love you, Kenny, you know, or something like that. It's like, all right, they're drunk. But then 4,000 boats later, are they all drunk? <laughs> Does somebody have a sign that says, go wish Kenny, like, welcome to Galway? I, I, it just, it was really cool. With the finish line a matter of miles away, Campo was clinging on to their advantage. However, the team wasn't taking anything for granted, having been in this position twice before during the race. So we'll just call it out 25 miles, and um, you can see, see we've got plenty on. Group Armour 
right on our tail, Puma behind them, Tally behind them, the four of us have sort of battled it out all day, well, all race. Yep. In the hands of the weather gods, I'm afraid. Like, if, if the breeze stays like this, we'll be okay, but I've got some very, very bad memories of um, Maldives and Lisbon, 25 miles. Camper wasn't the only boat with jangling nerves. Group Armour was within sight of overall victory. Seriously, we were so scared that something bad was going to happen before we arrived that we didn't talk much about getting there. We advanced and we waited and time was going so slowly and the only thing we wanted was to arrive. The faces on Telefonica told their own story. After leading for 38,000 miles around the globe, they weren't even going to step onto the podium. Unfortunately, the last 30 miles were finally quite light and easy, and it became a processional type of race. Just over 37 hours and 40 minutes after leaving Lorient, Camper with Emirates Team New Zealand crossed the finish line to seal their maiden leg victory. I was thought to think I was coming in here was that some of the other finishes where we've had it all go wrong for us right at the last. And we had a bit of a shift, but all good. Really cool. Group Armour sailing team only needed to finish fourth to secure overall race victory, but Frank Hammers's men don't know how to give anything other than 100%. Second position in leg nine, but overall triumph on their very first Volvo Ocean race appearance. A truly magnificent achievement. Disappointing. We would have loved to have uh, done a little bit better, but you know what? Other people sailed better than us. Just four and a half minutes after the American boat, Team Telefonica finished the leg. A subdued arrival for the Spaniards, clearly disappointed at the way the race had ended. Back out to sea, Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing was in full defensive mode. Team Sanya was determined not to finish last on the final leg. Uh, that's Sanya, quarter of a mile behind us. Got speed problems, they're, they're basically quicker than us. They're, uh, they've been coming into us all day. So, um, basically, we've got to do all we can now to hold them behind us for the next two hours. Our aim was just to try and get as close as we could to them and hope that an opportunity arose. We were getting hurt more at higher speeds, so when it was a bit windier and the boat speed was faster, then, then, then I guess we were suffering more, and when the wind was a bit lighter, we weren't suffering so much. We took a couple of nice wind shifts, got right in on their transom, nearly passed them, and they just dug their way out. We just got to the point where we were feeling a little bit comfortable, finally and then uh, there we came to a crashing halt. Okay, let's get someone on a torch. And next minute, whoosh, they stopped, and um, they hooked a cray pot, and then it was pretty much over from then. Not too sure, we suspect Abu Dhabi just picked up a uh, pot or something in the water, because they have stopped, so we are stretching out on the nice bit right now. Finally, it was our turn for something to go our way. Finally, Camper with Emirates Team New Zealand was able to lose the bridesmaid tag. The Spanish-Kiwi combination has been the picture of consistency, finishing second on four legs. But this time, the huge crowd cheered them home at the head of the fleet. A visibly emotional Chris Nicholson almost lost for words as Camper finally claimed that elusive leg victory they had been waiting for. Oh, mate, it's all at the right time, I'd have to say. 
I don't know, to be honest with you. Like, you look at this welcome here that we've had. Like, what a fantastic place. But um, I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm more happy for the rest of the team, to be honest with you. Like, I look at what everyone does in this program day in, day out. And, and everyone at Camper, and, and this is, I hope, I hope it's our sailing team's way of saying thank you to everyone. Group Armour sailing team sailed into port to claim second position and in the process secured overall race victory. Just reward for a team that just continues to get better and better and the culmination of a lifetime ambition for skipper Frank Camas and his team. Uh, for sure now it's the first. The, the best uh best race I did is the longer, the, the most hard, the more, most difficult I did, and uh, the highest level I can imagine. So I'm very proud about that, and uh, to finish first is uh, incredible for me. Third into port was Puma Ocean Racing, safe in the knowledge that they will be on the overall podium in Galway. 20,000 family members are out there cheering you because everybody seems to know everything about us and, and who we are and what we do and names and, and you know, too bad about this and we love you for this and, you know, it, it just, it was just a love fest, you know, and, and it just felt so good, especially knowing this is it, we're safe, 11 people are coming to shore, 11 people are going to see their family again, 11 people um, get to hug their kids, um, it's a, it's a feeling that's indescribable. The arrival of Team Telefonica in fourth position was tinged with regret. A clearly devastated Ica Martinez left to rue what might have been. Uh, now in this leg we, uh, we have a chance to, to do a good leg and um, and we didn't take it, so uh, fourth place is uh, what we merit, is what we have. So uh, that's it, that's over. Back at the finish line, a delighted crew on San Yalan crossed to take fifth position, the beneficiaries of Abu Dhabi's unfortunate lobster population. Just nine minutes behind them, Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing brought the offshore legs of the 2011 to 2012 race to a close. So, Sanya. Well, the old girl came good in the end, just as Mike Sanderson had promised, and the Galway crowd had stuck around to cheer her in. I saw the photos and I watched the video and stuff, and, but tell, you know, and then you go, well, it's five o'clock in the morning and it's raining, it's not the same, you know, and um, come around the corner and it hits you, so no, pretty amazing. Well, we've had a lot of bad luck in this race, and um, finally I think the luck of the Irish gave us a little snippet at the end. Mixed emotions for Ian Walker and the Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing Team. Despair at the result, but delight at the warm reception as Ian was reunited with daughter Zoe on her birthday. You can rely on Galway, can't you? And uh, I mean, they're such kind people. We know that from last time we were here. And uh, you know, when you've had a leg like we've had, it's, uh, it's just what you need to try and cheer you up and get you back on your feet. So thank you, Galway. huge amount of boats and happy people out there and you know you could see the lights of Galway on just in the distance and then to come round round the corner and see the sheer volume of people there was amazing like none of us had ever experienced a crowd like that and certainly I haven't and I just remember thinking at the time if there's ever a 
Volvo Asian race lead to win, this was the one. Well, it's incredible, because I know the victory will stay with me for the rest of my life. Even if I win another one, it's the first one that will stay. It's also the most surprising. You don't imagine that you'll ever win your first Volvo, particularly when you're considered an outsider, which means less pressure maybe. Quel que soit le résultat, on était content à partir du moment où on a été sur le podium pour être sur le podium. We fought to be on the podium, but we'd already gone around the world. After that, it's just more happiness. So it was a nice moment. Voilà. Donc c'était un bon moment. As we got closer, especially to winning the Volvo, only happens once in a lifetime. If it happens, so it's not something that we forget. C'est déjà très bien. Donc c'était c'était des moments des moments où qu'on n'oubliera pas. After a few days' rest, recuperation, and unbridled celebration, all that remained was the presentation of the Volvo Ocean Race Trophy. It promised to be the closest race ever, and it proved to be just that. And the victors? Group Armour Sailing Team, who will write another chapter in the glorious history of the Volvo Ocean Race. <laughs>